allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a motion for the approval of the agenda, which includes addendum, superintendent agenda, agenda 4, 13, 14, and 15, personnel consent agenda 5, K, and L, and other Board of Education business number 5. So moved. Second. Mr. Ballin, if I could, I just would request that the board remove item number 11 under the superintendent's agenda. And uh, the reason for that is. Um, that is a position that we were prepared to abolish. We did post it after a vacancy. We did not, we did not find any candidates that uh, we believe were appropriate. So we filled this position for the rest of the year um, <coughs> with uh, a partner company that we use, BCTS. Um, but just in talking with the union and talking with our uh, HR department, we want to take another attempt at posting the position. Uh, just as always, a good thing that with our unions to make sure that. We're attempting to fill those positions for qualified people before looking outside. So we just ask that item number 11 be removed and um, we'll certainly come back to you with the report on the program. So, whoever um, made the motion seconded, are you okay with your removal? Yes. Okay, okay. consideration. Okay, Mr. Roberts, follow up. Before we do that, Mr. Roberts, I don't know if you can pull Mrs. Weiss onto the. Yeah. yeah. So just for those of you who are here with us today, as well as those of you who are out in our audience, Mrs. Weiss is participating in the meeting, but virtually that is allowed currently up until June 30th um, uh, for Ohio Revised Code. However, in order for her to do that, we need to make sure she can be not only um, heard, but also seen when she casts her vote for anything that's on the agenda this evening. Okay. Mrs. Weiss, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mrs. Weber, please tell her. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mr. Comfort? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. And Mr. Ballas? Aye. Agenda is approved. I need a motion for the approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Any comments from the board? I just have a quick question. Um, do we need to mark that Mrs. Weiss was uh, virtual in the last meeting? It was not. Yes, I don't know. Um, that was my only question. I don't know if that's. I thought that I included that in the board <laughs> protocol section. Oh, okay. Maybe I think that, that I did know that. Okay. Within a minute. That she could just figure it out. Okay. I'll okay. come back to Thank you. Mrs. Weiss? Hi. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. And those are approved. As we start our meeting today, I want to remind everyone that all five board members are elected to represent our community, which consists of um, approximately 5,675 students, 820 staff members, and uh, roughly 35,000 community members. We use our mission and vision to guide us. Um, and I'd like to read what the mission and vision of the district is. Our mission is to cultivate a culture of academic excellence through inclusive, inclusive and innovative learning opportunities for the whole child. And our vision is to empower all learners to reach their full potential in a globally competitive world. Um, I ask as we conduct our business tonight, the board administration and community, we do so in a respectful manner. And while we may not always agree on every topic, we want to ensure, I want to assure you that each and every one of us want to do what's best for our students, staff, and for our community. Mrs. Weber, would you please um, discuss the meeting protocol? Thank you, Mr. Ballant. Uh, thank you to those who are here with us this evening um, in person, as well as those who are attending our meeting virtually. Um, for those of you who are in our virtual audience, you may access the uh, agenda for an addendum for tonight's meeting on our Board of Education website, sycamoreschools.org, on the Board of Education page. Um, upon approval, uh, minutes from board meetings will be posted on that same page. Uh, for those of you who are in our virtual audience, um, who have not informed me already, um, and if you would like to participate in um, either our public hearing this evening um, on the use of our IDEA funds, or for those of you who might also wish to address the board 
under uh, public participation for non-agenda items, please send those requests to our moderator today, Mr. Bill Fritz at fritzw at sycamoreschools.org, or you can also um, email those to me as well. We do have a chat function um, in our, um, that is available. We ask that you use that only for technical issues and not to provide comment about the meeting um, or to uh, make comments to the Board of Education or make, uh, ask questions. Um, as I noted, Mrs. Weiss is participating virtually under Ohio Revised Code. Um, so thank you, Mrs. Weiss, for, for attending as well. Did I miss anything? Thank you, got it. Okay, great. Great, we'll start off the meeting with um, a topic that's always um, one of the best things we do, and that's recognizing the outstanding accomplishments of our students. It's always a great day to get to recognize uh, one of our students. And uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about Lauren for a minute, and then I'm gonna ask the coaches and Lauren to come up and just share a little bit of uh, perspective with the board. And um, I've had the pleasure of working with Lauren, not only seeing her in athletics, but she's a great student leader. Uh, I should say was a great student leader as an alumni <laughs> uh, of our school district a couple of weeks ago. But if you were at graduation, Lauren displayed those leadership abilities because she was the MC for the graduation ceremony and did a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, huge kudos to you. But not only does she serve in that capacity and led mm -hmm. the student body, but <clears throat> many people don't know that she also served on the Sycamore Advisory Commission uh, for two years and really did a great job you know, sharing a student perspective, participated in numerous projects, and um, gave really good feedback to the groups about what's the impact to the student body. So on top of that, Lauren is a tremendous athlete. Um, and so we are bringing her here today because we are uh, proud to recognize her as a state champion um, from the Ohio High School Athletic Association and Girls High Jump. So um, I know Lauren and her coaches are uh, excited to be here and um, I've asked uh, Coach Ray, Coach Gutekunz, and then also Lauren to just come up and so people can see you at home. You have to come <laughs> here in the middle a little bit. Go ahead and stand up, come here in the middle. And I just wanted them to share a little bit with the board um, about their season. And yeah, the camera is actually going to be behind you. Oh, okay, so you're going to see the back of us. So you, you kind of, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. It's all about her. It's all about her. <laughs> so Coach Ray, if you don't mind introducing your yes, staff yes, exactly. and then talk a little bit about your season, and then we'll have Lauren share her perspective as well. Perfect. Thank you guys for having us. This is always a great opportunity to recognize one of our best. Uh, coach Boyle is her actual event coach. She is the high jump coach. Um, works directly with Lauren. Uh, Coach G is one of our distance coaches, but you know we all play a part in the success of our kids. It's, we consider ourselves not a boys team or girls team, but a track and field program, and all the coaches find a way and play a part. Um, it's easy to talk about this young lady. I've been talking about her for now about a month, um, <laughs> leading up to this point, which um, it all worked out. Um, she is a state champion, indoor and outdoor. That's fun. I'll let Coach Boyle talk more detail. I just want to give you just the background of Lauren's resume as far as, as an athlete. No doubt that that performance at uh, graduation was a proud moment as a coach and, and as a mentor to see you up there doing your thing, feeling confident and, and having everybody move at your, you know, your sound. So that was, that's a, I didn't even get to tell you congratulations <laughs> Thank on that. You. Um, what we do know about Lauren is Lauren's been with us for four years. Freshman year, she made the state. Easy peasy. We thought we were going to just do it again every year. Um, sophomore year, COVID hit. We didn't have a spring season. Uh, so she missed an opportunity to compete, uh, which we were worried with track and field that that may hurt her college chances. Uh, junior year was kind of that year where we didn't really do indoor track because we were still trying to figure out what we were doing. Uh, and outdoor track was protocols at the protocols. And uh, just wasn't the state meet wasn't back at the normal venue, which is a high state. It was at a local high school. So it felt like it was just another high school meet, not the state championship. Um, we went, she qualified, didn't do so hot. So coach Boyle and I had a conversations over winter saying, please allow me to do this plan I have for her. We know that she is capable of 
being a state champion on multiple levels. Um, it was up to her if she wanted it. Um, being in the advisory club, being the president of Young Scholars, being in multiple positions of authority, we didn't know if this was just something fun for her or if she really wanted to take it to the best or to the highest level. Um, we had a conversation in the pool, remember at the pool, and she says, I want to, I want to be the best. I want to push me. I, my, my, mo my moods are up and down just because of me doing a lot. But there's no doubt that my mood is wanting to be a state champion. And uh, the rest is history. She went undefeated. I think she lost one meet in high jump where she finished second to the young lady at Kings mm -hmm. and then proved to her that it was just an accident. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that it was, yeah. What was the proof? Yeah, no, 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 yeah. yeah, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. What was it? District, the bar, the, district finals, right? Yeah. It yeah. Was, yeah. And it was kind of yeah. that. It was a, you know. Well, it was another one of those messing yeah. official. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and so we, uh, some confusion. we figured it out. Mm -hmm. And, um, Back to back state champions, clearing the height of 5'8, um, and probably would have went higher if it was needed, but uh, that was the winning height. Coach Boyle, I know you would like to elaborate a little bit more. I would. <laughs> <laughs> Let, can, I, can I back up a little bit and introduce the reason why we are successful at Sycamore and Sycamore Track and Field Program? Coach G was a head coach at his previous high school and comes in as the head distance boys coach. Coach Boyle is an Olympian um, from. Uh, Ireland and Great Britain, and uh, she brings a lot of expertise that, and she's also a doctor. So she is making time to build into our kids. And we are just traveling around here just to get here. And she was just saying how much is a release to be on a break right now, you know, because we are intense and we're all are driven as far as not just for Lauren, but for 200 other athletes. So for her to give her time and his time and all the other coaches who can't be here, um, is a tremendous um, kudos to us and, and the athletic program at the high school and Mark Harden and his program and, um, and allowing us to do what we do, which is to build into you guys. Coach? Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Coach Ray does this to me. He tells me, uh, yeah, by the way, you have to say something. <laughs> 20 seconds right. before right. I have to say something. Yeah. <laughs> Not that first time. No, no, no. We're under pressure. We're, under pressure. we're good at that. <laughs> but, but the whole point here is to, for us to recognize Lauren. And she has been nothing but a star from our very first met her. She's talented in any which way. You pick any arena you want, and she can make um, herself excel in it. Um, when she chooses she wants to do something, there's no, there's no way she's not going to do it. She's absolutely wonderful. She's wonderful in training. She works hard. She communicates when we need to communicate about things. We can change things. We can work together. She leads the young ones yes. without question. She will encourage the young ones, not necessarily because they're super talented, because they're there and they're trying. And she's a wonderful leader. I've never heard her complain ever about anything. She just stands up and takes it. And, I've seen her compete, really compete four times in those four years. And she cannot be beaten. When she walks in to compete, she cannot be beaten. And she can jump a lot more than she did that day. But she's won everything that is to win. She even broke the school record, which has been there for 34 years. I'm so proud of you and I wish I missed you very much, but I'm, I can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Thank you. She is still competing. Um, she is going to UC where she'll be a bear cat. Um, and um, <laughs> studying again, whatever. Environmental science. Sorry. There you go. There you go. Lauren, share with us you know, your perspective from the, the year and just everything that's gone on. And, yeah. Craziness that is your life. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of as Coach Ray said, it really like starts, I've been doing track, well, since seventh grade. Um, that's when track and field like became a part of like some of the sports that we do here at the school. Before seventh grade, I had no idea what track and field was. So jumping into it um, freshman year, I met Coach Boyle and um, we had another coach, Coach Alexandra, um, down at the junior high um, in like seventh, eighth grade. During that summer, we like really just like 
Coach Boyle came out after her job, after everything in the hot summer heat. Um, and we would just work, me and like a couple of other kids work on high jump technique because during the summer or during the actual like season, of course, like we're competing and we're like doing like regular running workouts. So there isn't really much time to get down all of the technique, which goes under high jump, which is a lot. So um, just starting freshman year, qualifying for high jump, I definitely had that freshman crazy mentality. I was surprised that I lost, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I did not do too hot, of course. Next, um, next spring, we didn't have a season due to COVID. And then junior year is when, you know, um, we were all in it. Everyone had come back from a crazy year. Um, of course, just academically, life, <laughs> we're going through a pandemic. And of course, we did not have our sport to come to and just be ourselves to compete and to do what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So just like as a program in general, I know all of my teammates, we came back that season, like just with something different, even if it wasn't necessarily the mentality to win, it was a mentality, like just to be there and do your best, no matter what it is, to understand that we have a chance to do something great. And even if we don't necessarily complete whatever goal was put onto us or that we might have for ourselves, um, we worked hard through it. And eventually we did get what we wanted. So training junior year um, through winter, just a little bit, it helped like, I guess a little bit to kind of get the gist of training through winter and then going into spring and then kind of going into summer. So next year, which is this year that we have, um, <laughs> Um, we really just went for it, and I know me and my relay, Layla Walker, Bella Delgado, um, Audrey Schmid, we were running through the hallways because obviously you can't run on the track when there's ice on it. So during the winter time, we're doing these crazy hard workouts that at least seem crazy to us. I don't know if I want to say that. <laughs> but running through the hallways, just thinking about um, the springtime, that this is what we want to do, that we've worked so hard. Um, for these four years looking up to the seniors that came before us and now understanding that we are the ones who are leading the way. So all since winter, we've just been working and grinding and competing. And finally, a couple of weeks ago, me, I went for high jump um, and I got long the final goal. And oh yeah, I went for high jump individually, long jump individually. And then of course the four by one, me, Bella, um, Layla and Audrey, we got fifth or sixth, no, seventh in that. And then I got sixth in long jump. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> and of course, first in high jump. And just to think about all of those years of competing, sometimes not necessarily knowing what I'm doing, um, just like having jumps for no reason. And then finally putting training behind that, putting weights behind that, putting coaches that care, putting a person that cares behind um, my athletics is something that really just, I don't want to say surprised me this year, but something that I can be really proud of. So now I'm resting. It's summertime. Enjoy it. Um, <laughs> Good to change. It's, it's a bit. Yeah, not rest. too long, but um, soon to be a bear cat. Well, I guess I'm like kind of a bear cat. You're a bear cat. Yeah. You're always an aviator. You're always, yeah. Always an aviator, yeah. Yeah. Most important, but yeah. yeah. 15 <laughs> points. 15 points Sycamore scored, the girls scored at the state meet. 72 teams qualified for the state meet. We scored 15, which placed us 13th. Only one other team from Cincinnati area was ahead of us. That was Dakota East with a young lady who won the 100. She ran a great race. But uh, by herself, she carried, she carried <laughs> no, 13 know. out of 15 points. She carried us. But you were on the podium for all of your yeah. Yeah. Yes. Which, which for those that aren't involved in track that's and field, yeah. that's huge. That is, yeah. that is huge. Yeah, she, she came right with three medals. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Quite an accomplishment. Well, Thank you. On behalf of the administrative team, the board, I know on your coaching staff, we are all so proud of you. We're looking forward to hanging that banner. Yes. Uh, in the gym and recognizing you as a state champion, but also a school record holder, 34 years. Mm -hmm. uh, person that frequents UC for other events, you've just given me another reason to come to UC, which is to see you perform, you know, track and field and with that new team. And we wholly expect to hear the same thing that your coaches talked about 
I would expect to hear the same thing from your UC coaches that yeah. you're a born yeah. leader, yeah. you're a natural leader, and you're going to bring a lot to that program. So thank you for the legacy of excellence and greatness that you've left here, but also know that the young lady standing there at graduation, <laughs> we, re we recognize her as well as being yes. a tremendous leader here in this, in this district. So. And I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't emphasize what an outstanding contribution you made to the Sycamore Advisory Thank Commission you. for the last two years, more, and it really has been a pleasure um, to be able to serve alongside you on that commission. So Thank congratulations. You. Thank you so much. And just to also reiterate something that's already been said, since you were in my son's home when we first moved here, Lauren has been the nicest <laughs> human. Yeah, she is. Since she's I first. first met her in 2013. Yeah. She's That's not changed. No, no, she's the same. At all. So I'm That's proud to say that okay. you're a fabulous person. I really look forward to hearing about everything you've accomplished in the future. Thank yeah. you. We're going to have you. Go out in the lobby because we want to grab a picture of you okay. uh, with your coaches so that we can <laughs> celebrate this, you know, okay. continuing on. So thank yes. you again. Thank you, for thank you guys. Next on our agenda is the public hearing for input on fiscal uh, 2023 federal IEEA funds. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Um, this evening, Mrs. Spencer and I are just going to give you a brief overview of the funding allocation that we have just been informed of. Actually, today, I knew how Department of Education to be utilized for next year for um, our to support our students with disabilities. Um, they're called IDEA funds. We receive them. Um, both for our school age population, a very small allocation for our preschool uh, population of students with disabilities. And then uh, this year, we also have an allocation that um, was provided uh, due to COVID from the American Rescue Plan. Um, so we'll give you just a bit of background about the amounts, um, our preliminary plan for their use. But then also we want to just get some feedback from our community as well. So this is an opportunity for some public comment on potential uses of those funds. Okay. Um, so just overall, uh, to give you an idea of what kind of funding we receive in this area, um, our allocation for the 22-23 school year is $1.4 million to be utilized to support our students with disabilities. Um, of that, 160,000 of that is targeted to Moeller High School. Um, because Moeller is located in our school district, um, we administer uh, federal funds on their, on their behalf. So not only just for this grant, but for a few other federal grants as well. Um, they provide services for students with disabilities. And so <laughs> Spencer does a great job in working with them. Have a good rest of the assess their needs and then also to make sure that they're utilizing their dollars in compliance with federal guidelines. <laughs> this upcoming year, um, we are also going to be utilizing 15% of our allocation or uh, a little over $200,000 for early intervening services. Uh, Mrs. Spencer is going to give you a bit more information about that. Um, the remaining dollars that we have in the grant, at least if we follow uh, the plan that we've utilized this year, is we pri primarily the, the biggest portion um, is utilized to uh, provide employment or just to support many of our educational assistants who support our students in the classroom so that they can access um, our programming within our classroom. So that's the major thing. There's some funding for professional development. Um, use some in the past for psychological services as well. So Mrs. Spencer, I don't know if you'd like to add anything, anything to that in terms of some of the planning for this year. Um, I think that some of the purchase services that uh, in addition to what you, um, what Mrs. Weber has shared, um, have supported some consultation for uh, certified behavior analysts. Um, and we anticipate that they would, we would have that. And then just a small amount for supplies to support uh, programming and instruction for students with disabilities. Um, just also, our, our amount this year uh, for next year is maybe increased by $20,000. So it's not a significant increase over our current year. Um, 
The second, uh, and for our students uh, in preschool, I think our allocation, our allocation this year is um, right around seventeen thousand dollars, and we utilize that to support the service of a, a speech therapist for our preschool program. So minimal dollars, but we'll take whatever we can get um, mm -hmm. to do to support our students in those programs. Um, this year, we are also receiving uh, about $350,000 from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that's really to be targeted to help us um, with recovery services, to help our students who might have lost ground um, during the COVID pandemic. So we've already um, started to utilize those to some extent this summer with some extended school year services. So uh, we're underway with that. Uh, that's an area where we are still looking at how we might, and, you know, as we continue to assess student needs, those dollars can be used to help us fill, fill those gaps for those kids. So um, the only other thing I would just add is that one of the, um, one of the requirements of IDEA funds is these are really supposed to supplement what you're already doing. They're not meant to replace dollars that you're utilizing. Um, for your students already. So one of the things that we have to, to certify on an annual basis is that we have, have a maintenance of effort requirement. So whatever we have spent out of our general local funds the prior year, we are required to spend at least that amount the following year so that, and then utilize the IDEA funds on top of that. So um, just to give you an idea, last year, our maintenance of effort amount of the dollars that were used to support our students with disabilities was about $13.7 million. So that's the core local funding that we are utilizing um, for programming for our students with disabilities. Um, and then on top of that would be the IDEA funds to be utilized. So I don't know if I missed anything with that, Mrs. Spencer. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to mention in terms of the IDEA funds, uh, Mrs. Weber uh, mentioned that uh, we have about 15% of that that is targeted for early intervening services. Uh, we presented to you previously about the MTSS specialist positions that are short term that will help the district build a consistent MTSS framework and identify and uh, gaps uh, in learning for students and identify how to intervene early um, so that we can have that consistent framework in place uh, across the district, K-12. Can you say what MTSS is? Oh, sure. Multi-tiered systems of support. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so for the 13.7 million for the local funding for students with disabilities, I'm assuming students with disabilities doesn't mean that every student is under being covered under IDEA. That means it's a large group, right, of students that maybe are not, not on IEPs but just have a disability. Or is that part so of? What, if you thing? look at kind of the, the categories of expenses, it would be uh, primarily our teachers that, and it would be their those in regular education. It would um, it would be special education teachers educational assistance. So those um, adult supports to help our kids access the curriculum. Um, it's therapists. So any of those types of uh, things that would help um, support access to education. So it's those types of things. Transportation that is beyond the regular transportation, regular yellow school bus. Um, so could, I just want to jump in also. Could this also be used for medical disability to get filtration changes in classrooms for children who need it? For Is instance, it or could, could it? It could potentially, okay. yes. Uh, and it's, it's just yeah. as an I throw that out there um, for medical families. All right. Um, so, with that, we do this is also one opportunity for public comment. Um, for those who might not be able to make it this evening, I know Mrs. Spencer is open to having public uh, having comment on anything at any time. This isn't really about <clears throat> resources for the individual student. Those, um, 
discussions really are part of the IEP process. This might be more global discussion about things that might help uh, our programming, things like that, um, information that we might need in, in making budget decisions moving forward. Um, so with that, um, so if people are also people not are just you're going to email uh, Mrs. Spencer and you with ideas in the future. Would you like that, or do you want public participation in a meeting? How would you like that to move forward? I mean, the two the two of us are probably the key people working on the grant. Okay. Um, on this section of the grant, uh, so I would assume it's probably better to go through Mrs. Spencer because she probably have a much better idea about what. How those supports would be would be effective, um, as opposed to me. <laughs> you do it. Um, so anyway, um, we also it, people can give input at any time. This is just one of those things that, for the federal guidelines, they want you to have at least one opportunity at a public board meeting for people to pro provide input. So with that, I have three who have requested an opportunity to speak. Jennifer Godby, you're first. And we have three minutes. Yes. Is it okay for me to just stand here or do I need to? No, oh, you're great. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. okay. Am I supposed to state my name and my address? Is that right? You would state your name. Okay. Jennifer Godby. And uh, my address is 11357 Avant Lane. And that's 45249. Good evening. I am a mom of a rising seventh grade, minimally speaking autistic student here in Sycamore. I want to take this opportunity to share with you a training program called Communication for Education that was recently developed by an impressive collection of professionals in the field of special education. My family moved to Sycamore specifically for the amazing educators, innovation, and openness to diversity that the district offers. As the neurodiverse community grows and a better understanding of how these learners can be supported in the classroom is developing, we ask that you continue your dedication to all students in our district by considering implementing this new program for our educators. It is a comprehensive first of its kind training program that helps educators support students who use an array of alternative communication methods, such as augmentative communication devices, the PEX picture system, pointing, typing, and more. Research shows that unequal access to alternative communication methods is a major barrier for autistic students with little functional speech. This disconnect can lead to a student being unable to fully take part in the grade level curriculum and to adequately show what they have learned. Most autistic students also struggle with body regulation and sensory issues that can keep them from accessing or participating in the general education classroom. This is where communication for education comes in. This program is not methodology specific, but rather provides a broad foundation to address the needs of multimodal communicators. Topics include presuming competence, regulation strategies, relationship building, adapting academics, and building autonomy. This is a research-based program developed by professionals in the field of special education, such as college professors, special education teachers, behavior therapists, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, psychologists, clinical social workers, a pediatrician, and more. Communication for education will benefit our students, our educators, and our district. Our students will benefit from more inclusion and participation in the classroom and decreased mental health issues as they are viewed as competent participants in their education. Teachers benefit by gaining the knowledge and skills to better support their non-speaking or minimally speaking students in, the, in their classroom. They will also receive CEUs from this course. The benefits of equipping our educators with this one course would continue year after year as the foundational knowledge and skills gained would apply to many of our special education students within the district while cutting back on repeated training as our students move from building to building. Most work for this course could be completed during school hours requiring an average of only 28 minutes per day based on a five day work week. It is an eight week program with 15 online modules and once per week live online training sessions. We have copies of the professional contributors list of credentials, the research based sources used, course schedule and outline, the group pricing available for further review. Uh, thank you so much for your time and attention to such a needed opportunity. Please let us know how we can partner with you to bring this training to the district. 
next speaker is Cindy Burke. Cindy Burke, 10027 Winsag, Montgomery, 45242. Good evening, Sycamore board members. I have a son on an IEP who is non-speaking and a unique learner who will be starting junior high next year. Jenny just provided you with a quick overview of communication for education and why we are so excited to share information about this much needed program with all of you. This program is strong, building an even more solid foundation for educators, students, and staff within the district. Unfortunately, many educational staff have limited special education training. This can be difficult for both the teaching staff and the students causing frustration at the beginning of each new school year. The student is often not understood and lacks the ability to communicate effectively, which oftentimes leads to frustrations for all. To better explain, each new school year begins with a new group of teachers, educational assistants, aides, and intervention specialists. We understand that this can't be helped. Change is hard, especially when the student has a communication disorder. In most years, by the end of the school year, my son finds, finds himself starting to get comfortable and, and finding his groove. This, the issue is then we start over again. With this program, our students won't have to play catch up each year as the new educators will have bases of understanding already in place. This will add confidence to the educational staff to now be more knowledgeable and understanding on how to better support and meet the needs of the student throughout their day. This would help assist the teacher in the implementation of the IEP. All of the course modules combined will allow access to the curriculum. One last exciting point I want to share is that we are seeing more and more students with alternative communication methods attend and excel at colleges and universities, but only when the communication method has been properly supported throughout their school years and they are receiving FAPE, free and appropriate public education. This program allows, aligns itself both with IDEA, Plan B funding requirements, and FAPE. I recognize the Sycamore School District has been open-minded and continues improving while making changes when needed. The program is, this program is robust and broad enough to help so many. Just look at the diverse contributors, their research and references, which I have right here. I wanna close by sharing a brief note written from my son, Luke. This was some of his input to his most recent IEP. The team should know I am the same as other kids in my school, that I also have normal struggles and need to be checked in on occasionally to ask me if I need to ask a question. I do happen to like to be included in class discussions and definitely think I can add to the conversation if I'm given the opportunity to be asked to contribute. I enjoy learning and can also be an advocate for autistics that are seeking to be included. I can tell you that I need you to be a patient teacher that feels like I belong in your classroom. You get to be a teacher that is evolving and embracing the change that is needed in the world today. Thank you guys so much for your time. My name Christina. I'm going to ruin. I'm going to mess up your last. I'm still practicing. So how to Hi, Chris. How to uh, 4477 Classic Drive in Blue Ash. Thank you for the opportunity. Being here. I am the parent of a son going to junior year at Sycamore High School. He's also um, an athlete on the track team, so it's very cool to see them um, result. Um, Julian is a minimal, minimally speaking as well student, so I just want to quickly share something that he wrote recently for a school project. Bear with me here. We all have a dream by Julian Barker. Is equality a realist, realistic goal or just an impossible utopia? In the 1980s, people with disabilities hardly had any rights. Today, we're closer to an inclusive society, but people are still working hard to get equal opportunities. People with disabilities are twice as likely to be unemployed as neurotypical adults. Um, one in four adults in the United States are diagnosed with a disability. That means 61 million people are discriminated against in the workforce due to a label that acts like a scarlet letter. Disabilities can range from people with mental health disorders to veterans that have lost a limb in a battle. They aren't always visible and obvious, but they still need to be recognized. Some disabilities require more support and accommodations, but they still deserve the same chances as everyone else. Look at me. I have autism, apraxia, and OCD, 
that I have never stopped striving to be successful. When I was younger, no one understood me. Once people started to believe in me, I discovered all of my capabilities. Sorry, I get very emotional. I work hard to prove to the world that I'm just as important as anybody else. I have a lot to contribute to my society and I know I can prove that if given that, if given the right chances. Um, people are still trying to pass legislation to ensure everyone has basic human rights. We're fighting alongside Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ plus community and other act activist groups. Society has been fighting for change for a long time. We need to continue to improve the legislation to guarantee basic human rights. As Martin Luther King Jr. once said, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. Um, so I believe the Communication for Education program will really lay the foundation to help children achieve his dream and um, support it 100% and love the consideration. Thanks so much. Great. Mr. Fritz, did you have any other requests? I, no. I do not. And I don't know if anyone else in the audience would like to provide information. May I ask one question? Um, so does, we are really mainly talking about that American Rescue Fund money for the most part, right? And the 1.5 billion IDEA, Correct. not the larger amount, but the other. Correct. Does the American Rescue Act was money to try to help students because it was given to us because during the pandemic, so many students who have disabilities were impacted more negatively or disproportionately to the most typically developing children, right? To, to have, and you're saying we've decided, or your recommendation is to use the money for educational assistance and for MTS? Not, not the uh, American special? Rescue Plan dollars. Okay. So has that part been decided yet? That part, we are starting, we've utilized some of them for extended school year services mm -hmm. for this summer. I don't know. And some compensatory services. Okay. And also to support some services, um, contracted services for students who were not able to come to school because okay. of medical okay. needs. Sure. Um, so we provided instruction okay. um, for them okay. in the way that we could, sure. um, but it did cost some additional dollars to do that. Okay. And then for the 1.4 million, what would that, is that the EA and the MTS, MTS mm -hmm. specialist? Okay. Yes. So what I just would like to add that I know that one of the areas is early intervention for preschool, right? Because that was the, that was sort of the biggest area um, where students would not come to school because they were still young. They were three years old, so parents would just decide not to send them at all, right? So is there anything that our district is doing for that early group of like little ones, um, the young group that maybe missed that whole year or two? So that's the first two years of their, you know, learning how to be with other children, learning how to talk, how to walk, how to move their bodies, play. Have we as a district looked at that group of students? We, we look at them individually as per their IEP teams. Um, we have identified uh, potentially some of the funds that were identified for preschool through ARP um, uh, to address um, providing some more consultation services uh, for um, behavior. Um, kids who haven't been at school, not learning how to do school, um, require some additional direct services. So we have been um, looking at that uh, for implementation as an as needed basis, uh, but then also to help uh, support some of our uh, students and teachers, uh, the programming with some consultative services for next year as well. Okay. And then my last question, um, do we ever use the, the or is it possible to use American Rescue Plan recovery money or that 1.4 million for things like professional development for our staff? Is that, I mean, just as a possibility, is that even an option? It, it is allowed. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And in some ways encouraged. I mean, so. yeah. yeah. I think we did have an allotment for professional development. Yes. Thanks. I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming and especially the personal stories that you shared and 
you know, don't ever apologize for being passionate about your kids. And mm -hmm. we know uh, many of us sitting up here are parents and, you know, I, I know what you mean. It, you, we want you to advocate for your students and we want to hear from you. So we really appreciate all of you being here and sharing your perspective. And certainly we typically don't comment and don't respond because we have so much work that we have to accomplish during this meeting. But I, I will uh, make sure that we get back to you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> <laughs> but you're also welcome. But you're also welcome to leave. I see some running. Yeah. 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 It's okay. Oh, yeah. Don't take it first. Can, yeah. we, we put together some information. Mm -hmm. um, who can I? Who would like to have it? <laughs> we'll, we'll now make uh, Mr. Ballot responsible. <laughs> Don't worry. We Don't handed worry. it on. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to public participation for non agenda items. Um, Mrs. Warner, Ms. Prince, did you have any? I had two people who reached out um, via email. You see now is one. I don't know if that you have okay, any of this now. If you'd like to address the board. Um, Go ahead now. Now is now's the time. You have three minutes to share your insights. I'm Nan Marrow. I live at 9342 Blue Wing Terrace. And I'm here just proactively. Um, as you are all aware, Governor DeWine signed House Bill 99. Um, into law on Monday, which would pave the way for school districts to allow teachers and staff to carry firearms in the classroom and the school buildings with really minimal training. And um, I think a lot of you here um, agree with me that guns, more guns, is, does not make our children safer, especially guns in the classroom. And as a Sycamore parent of a uh, rising senior, and a 21 grad and 12-year um, um, resident in the district just want to make it known that we feel like this is a bad idea. And all the teachers I've spoken with and SLPs and intervention specialists, both in our district and um, broader um, Ohio teachers, are convinced this is also a bad idea, um, that the teachers are in the classroom because they love our children and are there to serve our children and protect our children. And there's just too much for them to handle to be able to deal with firearms and too much risk to our students. And I know speaking for my family, we would promptly relocate um, if, if Sycamore Community Schools ever voted to support a rule that would allow staff, um, you know, educational staff to, to carry firearms. Um, just wanted to share that and make that known. Thank you. Great. I do want to make a comment. Again, um, as Mr. Lewis said, we don't typically comment on public mm -hmm. uh, participation. Uh, we will be discussing House Bill 99 in our legislative update, which is uh, almost at the end of the meeting. But I did uh, just want to make a, a comment. On Monday, uh, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine signed House Bill 99 into law, which reduces training for armed teachers. It does not require school districts to arm personnel. The Sigma Board of Education will not be taking any action to change our policy that prohibits weapons on school property, which supersedes House Bill 99. This policy includes uh, policy, this policy, GBCB, states staff members are not permitted to bring deadly weapons or dangerous ordinance into a school safety zone. Policy JFCJ also states that the board is committed to, committed to providing the students of the district with an educational environment that is free of the dangers of firearms, knives, and other dangerous weapons in our schools. We continue to be vigilant in our efforts to ensure that the safety and security of all students and staff. This includes collaborating with local law enforcement to improve safety plans and conduct threat assessments, having full-time armed police officers as school resource officers in our 7th through 12th buildings, 7th through 12th grade buildings, as well as upgrading security features and safety training for our students and staff. So thank you. Thank you. Any additional public participation? I, I, the only other, I, Mr. Mazur, Jeff Mazur, had asked potentially to speak with the board, but I don't know if he's virtu participating virtually. Okay, we will move on. We'll probably like, we'd probably like to have that. Slide, there there was it was on the same topic. 
Yes. Okay. There are some people there on their phone that we don't know who they are. Okay. I don't um, have any other. I will send that statement to him, um, okay. and then we will also include it. We're going to include it in the board minutes. Okay. Moving on to superintendent's um, agenda, Mr. Lewis. So uh, just into the year, um, Mr. Pritz, I was going to say you have control over there. So moving forward to the yep, keep going, healthy age update. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> He's coming to give it to me. So, yeah. <laughs> so a good, you know, just a good summary, a good, you know, kind of end of the year uh, update, um, just to kind of summarize, you know, obviously this year. We've heard it a lot from our, our team members, our staff members. I think we all had high hopes going into this year for um, a different school year, and we were met with um, not the different school year that we had so desired, but uh, a huge thank you to uh, Mrs. Spencer and our contact tracing team, our administrators that spent countless hours um, doing contact tracing and adjusting to the um, changes that the state and Ohio Department of Health and local health departments made throughout the school year. And uh, I can say it was a successful school year, even though we had to deal with many challenges. Uh, and certainly we thought COVID would be a thing of the path. So healthy aims, I, I kind of look at this year in two halves. So we had the uh, very intense uh, you know, school year, which was the first part of the school year with very heavy on healthy age updates and healthy age protocol and really looking at things. And then after February, you know, we still were doing all of our contact tracing and tracking, but it was much reduced compared to the first part of the year. So uh, we did get to experience some normalcy and I think everybody enjoyed uh, getting some normal activities and normal things happening in school. So um, but I do appreciate all the efforts of the teaching staff, the classified staff, making sure our buildings were clean, uh, our bus drivers, and numerous other people that were involved in this process. So um, you can see on the screen, uh, just to share with you some perspective, um, the last week of school, um, you can see in totality across the district, uh, 31 positive students very spread out uh, throughout the uh, school district. You know, the highest building being the high school, you gotta remember graduation was in there. So, um, and some other uh, larger activities. But overall, we fared fairly well against, um, you know, some of our numbers even early in the year. And certainly we don't want anyone to be sick, but, um, you know, we did have some COVID positive cases, but very spread out. And then you can see we had a few uh, staff positive cases across the district. The thing that's very different um, you know, as we go to, um, well, I'll show you one other slide and we'll talk about kind of the other piece. That I now have it. <laughs> so you can see the, the, so 6 3 was the last day of school. So by the time that we got to the last day of school, we were down to one positive case and a few staff positive cases. And then, you know, across the district. But you'll notice that quarantine was zero um, on, both, on both slides. Um, on most of the slides. You can see six students in quarantine on the, the far column there, but you know, when you see zeros, what changed for us was the quarantine guidelines um, and how many students they were quarantining versus by the end of the year, what the protocols were. So uh, that was a huge help keeping students in school and being able to educate students um, you know, without them being in quarantine for long periods of time through the protocol uh, that we were offered. And then just a couple of graphs, just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about with the, the school year. Um, if you recall, we, you know, we navigated the first part of the school year um, with, um, you, I'll say, optional masking at the 712 building, buildings, and then we had required at the K-6, pre-K-6 buildings. Um, and we felt strongly because of, you know, some of the things that weren't available to our younger students and our most vulnerable population. And then you might recall right after winter break, we made a decision to move to um, required masking for all uh, for a period of time. And then you can really see the drop off by February. Uh, we went to optional for all and we experienced very low numbers uh, for months on end. And then we had a small spike um, towards the end of the year in the spring, but really navigated it very well um, with, with our student body and our staff population. So. Uh, that just gives you a sense of positive cases. 
And then again, that quarantine, you know, as those quarantine guidelines changed, you can see how much it impacted those numbers comparative to the beginning of the school year. So um, I think you can see the positive cases weren't very different, but the quarantine numbers were very different, which certainly assisted us uh, very well. And then the last thing I just wanted to bring for the discussion or, uh, you know, just the update, I did speak to, uh, I'll, I'll say speak to, I emailed a few times with uh, Greg Kesterman, who is the uh, commissioner of the Hamilton County Public Health Department. Um, I just asked him, you know, as of 6-7, you know, what are the things that we know? Because, you know, I think we expect there'll be some updates uh, from the Public Health Department, Ohio Department of Health moving into next school year. You know, we do know that masks to stay, test to play remain. Um, so we were doing that throughout the end of the year. Um, and we, we felt strongly that it was important to not change things in the middle for people and you know, our communication methods for people. Uh, so we decided to maintain a dashboard through the end of the year and so that people could find that information. Uh, for a positive case, we, it was still isolate for five days and then you could come back after five days asymptomatic while you're not showing symptoms and you had to mask for five days. Uh, you no fever, things of that nature. And what he really shared with me is, you know, the, the responsibility has really shifted to parents and families, which is very similar to other illnesses. If you're not feeling well, you know, it's not really the school district's responsibility. It really is a parental responsibility to make that decision whether or not they're to go to school or not uh, based on their symptoms or illness or uh, things of that nature. So, um, the only other thing from our standpoint, um, you know, I, I shared at the beginning of this conversation or beginning of the Healthy Aves update is, you know, we just we put a tremendous amount of resources, time and people um, into this process. And thankfully, as the year went on, especially in the spring, uh, we were able to kind of reduce that. Um, you know, moving into next year, if masks to stay, tests to play would remain, you know, we would still need to do some tracing. and. Um, I'm going to, you know, make some changes with our tracing process. Mrs. Spencer would not be that person doing that work. Um, Mrs. Spencer needs to be, you know, back focused on, and certainly don't get me wrong, COVID was a big important thing last year um, in previous years, but I really want Mrs. Spencer focused on her work um, and the work of her department, which is serving students with special needs and, you know, being able to make sure that their needs are being met and certainly she was able to do that, but I can't have her doing two full-time jobs um, to be able to make our way through this process. So we would continue to work with our uh, contact tracers and, you know, kind of do a, a subcontract with them of, you know, they would still assist us with that process as long as we can find able and willing people to continue to do it. But Mrs. Spencer has a great relationship with those people and they would manage that process for us. And, and certainly if we got into a heightened situation, Obviously, we would staff that up, or if it's not very intense, we would staff that down as needed. But um, so that's, you know, as of right now, that's what we know uh, going into next year. And, you know, happy to answer any questions of the board. And Mrs. Spencer, I don't know if there's anything else that you would add on top of that since you've been so heavily involved in this process. Well, I, th I think we're just anticipating having some further guidance from either the Ohio Department of Health or uh, and or the um, Hamilton County Health Department because in, in advance of next school year so that we can plan appropriately, whatever that might look like. Uh, but indications um, at this point, you know, there's no timeline for that. Um, so like we've done for the past two and a half years, we'll respond. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully, more than a day or two before it starts. Yeah, that would be, be well, that would be <laughs> you know, the one positive I'll say to that, Mr. Ballant, and you know, <clears throat> construction can create issues, but it can also help you in those situations. And I feel like construction allowed us to be more prepared because we got the information well in advance of our school year versus some of our other colleagues were getting it, you know, right around the start of the school year. And it is tough to make that shift or adjustment uh, to the beginning of the school year. So I actually have a couple of quick questions for is the desk board going to be staying for the fall because medical families need to make daily or weekly decisions for their medical family situations at home, whether it's the student going into school or somebody at home who needs that student not to be in school. Are we going to have a dashboard available for those families to access information so they can make decisions? We, as I've communicated previously, our, our intent was that, again, most 
There is no requirement to report, there's no requirement from Hamilton County Public Health to report any longer. So, you know, a dashboard really um, is only as good as the information we're getting. So if people aren't reporting the information and no longer required to do it, the accuracy of the dashboard is not necessarily 100% um, certainty. So our intent was always to carry it through till 6-3. Again, so there was no major shift in our, our work, but as of 6-3, our intent was that we were no longer going to uh, provide a dashboard on our website. Okay, so how will medical families access information to make their weekly decisions going forward if there's no more dashboard? If I could just say the name. Um, <clears throat> We have a small number of families who we have been working directly with to help support who do have a situation where they have to monitor very closely. So um, in those cases, we would definitely, if there was a spike in the, uh, that we were made aware of uh, from families um, in cases, we would definitely communicate that to those families and within those buildings. You know, if it's somebody that is attending SIMS, the numbers at the high school might not be relevant, but the numbers of SIMS would be very relevant for them because that's where their child well, is. Well, let's say they have another child in another building also, that they need to know the entire situation, making decisions moving forward. It could affect multiple buildings for families too. Could potentially, yes. That's going to put that out there. So just to follow up with that. So if a family has that circumstance where they need to know for their family, should they reach out to you? Who do they reach out to? to we would be that. doing that proactively. Okay. Oh, you do that already? Yes. We, no, we don't do that now. I'm just saying we would do you that would just proactively. Do it proactively. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because the, uh, the information on our dashboard is not going to give people specific information about their classroom. I mean, it's just numbers of each school. If we see spikes, a huge spike, then we may end up going back to providing a dashboard. But as of right now, you know, the information for the most part, for the last few months, it's been very minimal that people could gather from that. And I would imagine, Mr. Lewis, that if there were an outbreak, there would be communication, oh, mm -hmm. more than a dashboard that would go out to the parents to inform them. I mean, we've been very open and transparent through all of this. Um, I'm sure that I have confidence in our staff that if there is a concern that needs to be elevated to our parents, that, that we still communicate. We want to continue to take care of all of our students. All our staff, and we want we, as we've said all throughout this, we have nothing to hide for people. I know at certain points, I think people felt like different things were happening. We really want to be as proactive and as uh, transparent as possible with all the information we have. And we'll do the best we can with it. But I also, I think you, you've probably heard this from us before. We want to get back to focusing on education um, and really being intentional about where we want our district to go. Uh, for the education of our students and you know that's I think that's critically important if the climate allows us to do that next year we're we're prepared that if it doesn't we know how to react to it uh, but I think you know we're all going to go in with high hopes that we can have a normal school year next year where we're talking to you all about yet yeah, great educational things that are going on in our building and not LBA updates. So are we, um, is the DART team going to be involved with any process before the school year um, starts again, just to find out from the local hospital health department situations that are going on? If we have a need for it, um, our, our DART team has not met um, in several months because those people are busy professionals. Um, and we've committed that if the numbers stayed low, there wouldn't be any need to meet. So uh, we would only bring them together if there was a need or uh, there was some concern that we felt like we needed to run something by them or get information. They text me, they uh, call me, you know, they would be proactive in their communication with me and say, hey, I think we really need to meet them. Um, our team's open to that. We just we didn't want to have those busy professionals coming together for weekly meetings was what we were doing at one point. And, you know, it seemed like we were just reviewing the same data over and over. So if the need would, would be there, then we certainly would do that. Great question. Anything else from the board? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next on our agenda is master study plan update. You can just, there we go. Good.
Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. Always an exciting time, again, to be able to talk about our facilities and all the projects happening across the district. I love starting with this slide because these remain our active projects that we're still working towards. And um, just to call out really quickly, I know that we all think maybe Sims is done, but we're putting the final touches this summer by putting uh, new doors in the building and then also upgrades to the gymnasium. But Mr. Lewis, if you want to move to the next slide, there are two projects I specifically want to just update you on most importantly is green. Um, that is our next building that's going to be coming online and we're working um, very aggressively towards our temporary oc occupancy on July 1st, uh, working with uh, the city of Blue Ash, the city of Montgomery and all others to ensure that um, we have what we need to be able to get that occupancy. I always put out a reminder that just because we have temporary occupancy doesn't mean that we're moving in. Um, it's the first step in our ability to get into the building and start getting things going. Um, I was in the other day and just to share with you, it, it is just looking phenomenal. Um, you can see in one of these pictures here, um, they're starting to lay down the LBT floors in the hallway. Um, the carpeting, um, the kinetic flooring is already in. Um, all of the academic areas, the lockers are in, the ceilings are in, the paints, the final coat of paints on. The air condition is very cold over there in that <laughs> area, I can attest to that. Um, and as you move kind of um, towards the administrative wing, uh, they're starting to put some of those final touches on closing up the ceilings, um, starting to work on the floors and things like that. And so um, then if you look outside and you start to look at kind of the site development work, the front parking lots being paved, the bus lots getting the final pavement. In fact, our OAC meeting tomorrow is going to be here because they're going to be putting that final coat of blacktop on that back lot. So um, things continue to progress extremely nicely over there. Obviously, there are areas that we continue to keep an eye out for. Um, just as we start to close things up there. Uh, but overall, things seem to be going um, very well. Um, I do want to mention, too, this last bullet point because it's exciting. I know for our child nutrition director and that team, uh, they were putting all the kitchen equipment in um, the other day. So it actually looks like somewhere where our students can have a meal. So that's exciting. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, the next project I want to update you on here is our multi-use field. Um, again, shout out to... Um, our team at SHP, they provide us monthly drone photos of all of our projects. I think that these are the best view into the progress, especially out on our multi-use fields, our exterior athletics, because it kind of gives you that, that um, look of what's going on there. So you can see the outer perimeter there. That's the concrete. That's so the field will be framed in. Um, we have moats that's coming online. One of the things that I do want to point out, and I think I mentioned this at the last meeting, but it's always important to mention, we have had 18 weather related days on this project um, that we have not been able to work. Uh, we had the wettest May in 100 years in the city of Cincinnati in this region. Um, I tell you that because we still remain optimistic about our target date, um, but our teams, it just creates more, um, I'm going to say organized chaos out on that property because everybody has a specific point in time they need to get out there. Our turf folks, our bleacher, um, company uh, must go for our lights. And so um, shout out to HTC who is coordinating all that work. As you know, they're out there doing that, but we also direct bought many of these um, different aspects of the stadium. And so they've done a phenomenal job to try to organize all the different personalities of these companies um, to keep things moving out there. But I did want to make sure that we understood um, the significant amount of rain and what that does to the projects out there. Um, you can see some of the uh, important dates here. Um, Stadium lights of 620, um, moats was out on 613. That was pushed back to this week. Um, but again, they're still making great forward progress on that. Um, the other big one is the installation of the underground conduit for the electrical and our technology. Um, obviously, you have to have technology out of the stadium. Um, we need Wi-Fi, um, but we also need electronics to be able to operate the scoreboard and things like that. Um, this picture is a little bit out of date as well because they are actually going vertical on our block for our concession area at the moment as well. So things are starting to look more defined. The campus parking next to the stadium is starting um, to take shape as well. So overall, um, it's great to see the progress that we have happening out on that piece of property over there. Next slide. Um, if it's okay with you, I can just roll right into the transportation. I know Absolutely. that was a different item, but we'll kind of roll in there. Um, I do want to introduce, um, I have Allison McKenzie with me from our architectural firm, SHP. Um, she's my wingman today. So if there's any questions that you have, 
I know she'll be willing to pop in. Um, she has been a phenomenal help to us as we've gone through so many of our projects. And I know if uh, you're part of our um, if you're a part of our kind of core teams, you've you've worked with Allison as well. So um, I, I did want to I updated that timeline slide, so I don't know. Can you? I did want to the meeting. But, okay. Yeah, I'm, I apologize for that. Um, I did want to give you somewhat of an overview, kind of update on what where we're at with transportation, and share with you some of kind of the mile mark moments that we're going to be having. Um, so first off, uh, right, a couple things that we need to understand is that we are at the point where we have the final um, design, um, kind of design and orientation of the site that's been verified. We're currently working right now on the lot split um, and discussions with the city on some of the ongoing alignment. Um, we have the 50% construction drawings, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight, um, and a lot of those permits are kind of being finalized. The one thing that we continue to work through on all this is our environmental, um, no updates there, but no major concerns, so we're progressing very nicely. Um, really quick, though, before I move into these slides, I do want to share with you some of the projected timeline that we have for the construction of the facility on the property. Um, from June kind of to this August, we're working through the design phase. Um, in August, we plan to bring forward an opportunity to bid the project. Um, September through December 22nd is when we anticipate site development happening out on that property. So that would be moving of the dirt, that would be the formation of the parking, which we'll share with you here shortly. Um, and then somewhat between that September 22 and June of 23, that's when that building construction is going to happen. So there's really two components, right? There's the site development, but then there's also the pre-engineered metal building that we need to put on the site. Pre-engineered metal buildings are still um, caught up in supply chain um, kind of issues in regards to the time frame that we need to construct that building. And so what you'll see is that um, the line of the land of the property will be complete. The buildings don't take a little bit longer um, to get. Um, but overall, I will say, and Allison could talk to this a little bit more, but um, some of those supply chain issues that we're seeing are starting to um, ease a little bit. Um, which may be helpful on the projected timeline as well. So I just wanted to kind of give you a, this is, this is what we hope to achieve. This is the timeline we're hoping to move forward with um, as long as everything kind of um, lines up. So if you'd like to move to the next slide, um, this is an overview of our property. So again, this um, property is located where our temporary property is on the old PNG North facility. Um, it's in the back kind of corner that is near Grooms Road. It's close to five acres. Um, what you can see here is we've gone through multiple iterations of what this property layout uh, could potentially look like. This is a very long and narrow piece of property. And so um, there's not a lot of different um, ways you can lay it out in regards to where you might place that building. What we wanted to make sure we were doing though is we were putting the building in a place that was somewhat equidistant between both the parking and the buses so that when our folks are coming, um, they, they're not walking from one end of the property to the transportation compound all the way out to their buses. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, mainly, though, we do have buses that are coming in and out of this property at all hours of day um, after field trips late at night. So we wanted to make sure it's a very secure space for our staff as well. Um, you can see the car parking there that would be on the east end of the property. That blue block there is our compound or our bus garage, which I'll show you kind of how that layout's going to look here in a second. That purple block there is the fuel station, which will be able to fuel four buses. Um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to replicate what we had. We, want, we knew what we had worked, so we tried to replicate that on that site. Um, and then you'll see the bus parking that's on the other side over there. Um, one of the things I do want to mention as we look towards this plan is obviously um, our buses need electrical hookup. Um, they're diesel motors, so what we want to make sure that we're doing is they're warm so that they can start in the morning, but we're also looking forward to about the potential of what would an electric fleet look like in the next 5, 10, 15 years, not that we're making that move now, but how do we make sure we're investing in the right infrastructure now to be able to make that a reality, so we're working with SHP and others to ensure that we're looking in that area and what we need to do there. So um, you can see that access road. That road currently exists. It's more of a quote unquote access road that was going into that property, that would then follow um, the potential of the city eventually putting a road in there, but that connects to groom. So our main, our main in and out of the transportation facility, excuse me, 
um, will be Grooms Road, not Reed Hartman Road. Okay. Um, and that is a win for our team, actually. Um, they much rather be pulling in and out of Grooms than pulling in and out of Reed Hartman Highway. Even though it's lighted there, um, there's better access off of Grooms. Okay, next slide. Okay, so you can see um, this is the rendering or the drawings of the um, transportation compound. So um, you'll notice there's two shots there. The first shot in the top uh, upper right is the actual layout of the facility. And what I wanna point out here is that this was not uh, Brad sitting behind a computer working with SHB and saying, this is what I think a transportation compound should look like. <laughs> um, because I would not be the first person to tell you what a transportation compound should look like. Um, we actually did many focus groups with our transportation team. We let them come to the table, um, really have some great conversations. And what those conversations sounded like was it, um, what, do you, what do you wish for? What would be amazing? It was what works really well right now in your facility and what doesn't. And let's talk through that to help better understand how we can create a, a building that's going to meet your needs, not only now, but in the future. And so we had some really good conversations around that. Um, and so you can kind of see the layout there. It's pretty um, somewhat what I would say is traditional in this respect that um, it'll have more of a secured entry to that facility than we do now. So there'll be a vestibule, um, there's conference space, kitchen space, but there's also individual offices. Um, and then as you get to the high bay area, um, you'll see on that side that we do have some, um, some locker rooms for our mechanics and showers in the event that they um, need to rinse off or anything like that. Um, we're going with three bays, um, and in those bays, they're going to be in the floor lifts and things like that. The change with this facility, comparatively speaking, to the old facility is that um, it was designed with a mezzanine. So above the um, office space, that, that kind of right side there, um, there's a second level that's a mezzanine that allows for storage of parts, um, equipment, and other district type storage as well. That was one of the priorities that we had because in our current facility, we do have kind of a second level we had a second level mezzanine where they could store some of those parts and things like that. So again, our goal wasn't to create um, this uh, bigger, better, huger facility with a lot more amenities. It was how do we replicate what we have um, in a cost effective way, but also thinking about the future and the future needs that we have. So um, if you want to move to the next slide, you can see an outside um, kind of uh, outdoor rendering of what the building will look like. Again, this is a pre-engineered metal building. It's very similar to the type of building that we had previously for the transportation compound. Um, that green line there on the side is um, going to be a brick facade. The city of Blue Ash, the city of Montgomery, most cities or townships um, require some type of, um, how would I say that, multi? Yeah, they, they, they want you to dress your building up. But we'll, we'll put it that way. So we're planning a little bit of a brick wainscot. Um, we still need to go through approval process with them, but but we feel like you know we've had some talks with them. And they feel like this amount of brick will be enough to to make them feel better about this building that it's not completely utilitarian, has a little bit of uh, of an aesthetic value as well. Yeah. Um, so you can kind of see how that looks. Again, the three garages. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to increase the number of windows somewhat in the building for sightline visibility into the lot and things like that. So again, just give them um, kind of a, an updated feel of that facility itself. Okay. Um, any questions in regards to any of the updates or the transportation facility? Yeah, I do have one question. Okay. Um, do we have any timeline for lease agreements? We are working through that right now. And what is the latest? <clears throat> so our hope is to have, so we're working directly with client and jurors to get the lot split. That's kind of the big thing right now. So that property was a massive piece of property. Um, so we have to go work with our legal counsel and client and jurors, civil engineers to get the lot split done for the title. Um, that should be done next week. Um, once we get that, um, we are looking good on the land lease itself, um, but then we'll be able to bring it to you for review. <coughs> so our hope is still to get that done um, by mid-July. Um, at the same rate, we're still waiting on that environmental piece. And so it's, it's kind of, we're working parallel with that. 
we so knowing that we cannot approve the bids until we have the lease. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a it's a it's a dance, but we're we're dancing very well. <laughs> okay. Any other any harder questions for Allison? <laughs> Here. Yeah, sure. that you'd ask a really hard question. Yeah. All right. Um, I need a motion for the resolution. I need a motion for the resolution approving GMP amendment number five to CMR agreement with HGC construction of the Sycamore High School project. So moved. Second. Second. Yeah, number four. So <clears throat> we we talked to you about this previously. Um, you know, this is to get us moving forward. Uh, just understanding, getting a better understanding of the not only the scope but the cost of uh, the total natatorium uh, project and I think a complete renovation of that uh, facility um, in tandem with this procedure and this. Um, his very generous donation from his family. It's number four interior athletics. I just okay. number looks four. Like this is actually yeah. number four. It looks like the addendum should have had number Sorry. number. It should have been number five. So which one are we on? I'm so on this is the talking natatory. This is so the addendum is to the SHP. Yeah, the addendum is listed as number four. Right, but it really should be number five. Okay, so oh, then I, I need a different motion, right? Sorry. Mm -hmm. So then I need a motion for the resolution to approve amendment number five to SHP agreement for the design of Sycamore High School renovation and site improvement projects. Um, not a tour, not a tour, not a tour, not a tour in design. <coughs> so Second. Okay. Now, now we can. <laughs> Sorry, I was really confused. Just fast forward all that information. <laughs> <laughs> and so the other, basically the other portion of this is, uh, you know, we wanted to bring the board up to speed on, um, you know, how do we get to uh, being able to pay for uh, these couple of pieces? Because we talked about uh, the need to be able to advance, you know, move forward with the 275,000 to be able to get those 30% drawings that will give us great information about the total cost of the natatorium um, and helping us make decisions around that. So Mrs. Weber has gone through some um, work looking at the budget and you know being able to navigate uh, not only this, but um, I think the next item, it kind of bleeds into that a little bit of uh, being able to hit uh, our GMP uh, for the high school for the interior athletics. So, um, we can give you that information and share it with you. What we're sharing with you is the um, budget status sheet for the high school that we uh, share with you at every, every time that we have change orders so you can keep track of uh, the overall budget for this. Um, for the high school project. Uh, what we have, have done is two things since you've last seen this is number one, um, included a, a line in the pool renovation um, for the design in the soft cost area. Um, that was done by reallocating some of the funds that we had had for building construction that would have gone toward the pool renovation itself into pool design as well as that's about $225,000 that we need to be allocated with an addition of $50,000 that we have been holding in escrow um, for, for the pool renovation based on pool rentals that we've received over the years. So overall, an increase of $50,000 in the, in the high school budget um, at this point in time. You also see when you get to, um, back in the, uh, in the part of the budget where we're looking at hard cost, um, con uh, the construction costs, we've also noted um, the addition of GMP5, which is the cost of the interior athletic scope um, of about 4.9 million. By adding both of these items into the budget, what we have, what we have realized is that we are over budget 
um, for the high school if we maintain our contingencies, um, ongoing contingencies, as well as the funds that we need for, for furnishing. We're over about $400,000 right now. Um, our recommendation to be able to fulfill both of these items is that we would look at reallocating six, $600,000 from uh, the roof improvement that we had done several years ago to um, change those from being funded by the bond issue to being funded by our capital improvements. The reason we're saying we're asking for 600,000 is because that would cover the 400,000 for the main, main GMP for the interior athletics. It would also give us some allowance for an alternate that we think that we're probably going to want to take at least a part for some noise proofing in the gymnasium as well. Um, this recommendation for the interior athletics is not because of additional scope, it's because of cost uh, issues that we're finding with continuing to approve these GMPs at, at this point in time as opposed to a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. So that is how we be putting together the ability to move forward with both of these items. But we will be discussion. Our, our other option would be to reduce our contingency, potentially reduce some of the furniture costs. So when I look at this, the very bottom right hand corner, I see some $1.7 million still remaining in the project. Yeah, it's 1.2 for furnishings and then the construction contingency. And some dollars for soft cost contingencies, including permitting, with the, which we know we'll have one for the interior athletics, and then remaining soft cost contingency. I know one of the biggest uses of those dollars is um, movers, plans, continuing moving around the building, moving items around the building is ex pretty expensive. So, how confident are we that? We can hit the rest of these numbers. Is this a one time ask, or is this six months from now there's, there's going to be additional money needed for the next? So, is, okay. so, this is the remaining GMP on the building for the interior athletics. The other piece is the furniture for the 1.2 million. So, what, with the furniture, um, we can value engineer that. We had to do that at Green. We're going to have to do that at the junior high. So, we have the ability to tailor that back if we need to. Um, and so from that standpoint, um, we don't have anything in another GMP floating out there for another phase of the work outside of what we might commit to with the natatorium down the line. So if there were, if there were to be money left at the end of the project, could it be put back into the roofs? Or I mean, what happens if there's money at the end of the project? It would be by Ohio law, you have to use it for capital improvements or potentially paying it back to on retirement so they can pay off your group bonds. Given how so what would amount be the amount that it would be, right. so what would be the do. point of pulling that money out now from the roofs instead of just waiting to see where we are at the end <laughs> if we needed to put that money from the roofs back in for furniture? I think if we wouldn't commit to it now, it would make us we would be approaching this as though we basically had no contingency dollars right now. I just think it would be delaying the inevitable. Yeah, there, there's, when we talk about the contingency, contingency at the high school, we've been smooth sailing to this point. Um, we haven't gotten into the gym. We're just now getting into the cafeteria. Um, we had a pipe issue the other day. So as we get into these bigger spaces and more complex spaces, that's where we're more concerned about the contingency than it was in the academic area. So um, I would hate to chew up that contingency knowing we've got some of these significant areas that we're still addressing um, over the course of the next five to six months. Um, and, it, and it might be, I don't know, how, if, if it, if it um, would make the board more comfortable, maybe you make that a condition mm -hmm. Of the motion is that you know, this isn't to support additional scope. It's not Absolutely. to support additional things that you need uh, or, or want. It would be 
any remaining funds need to be put back into the working funds. And I think you know those those of us that were around <laughs> decision that I know we struggled with going back and forth of you know, we we planned those capital improvements for you know we plan them out five years or more. Um, and I know that was a difficult decision because we wrestled with it for a while at that meeting of whether or not to use bond funds or continue to use capital improvement funds. Um, but you know, that's one of those things that we know we have to continue to maintain our roofs and no one, I don't think anybody on the board nor the district team, we all were on the same page. We need to up, update and continue to upgrade our roofs so that we can protect our assets. Um, I think, you know, to answer your question, it's really, there are just different pots of money. It's where do you want to pay for it now versus having some protection or insurance. But it sounds like you would like yeah, so, some reassurance at the end. Well, I mean, we did. Obviously, when we made the decision to, to do the roofing project out of the levy versus capital improvement, we had no idea that construction costs were going to significantly go up, that we're going to go through COVID, you know, all that good stuff. So the thought was taking it out um, at the time because um, we thought we had room within the, in the, in the levy. I get that part of it, sure. But if you take $600,000 out, is that? Delaying something else that's scheduled for capital improvements, or how to, are we taking away something that needs to be done? You know, how does that impact the capital budget? I believe when we look at the capital budget, there are a few things that we feel like we could either chunk it a little bit differently because I think the next big project is actually the roof of Blue Lash. Um, so the thought would be to um, phase that work in over four years instead of three. Yeah, correct. Um, as, a, as a potential way to reallocate our capital dollars. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's really, if you look at our capital that you had approved, the biggest chunks of what we spend is on our roofing. Um, the biggest issue that we have is the blue ash roof. It's an ongoing issue. Um, we were being a little bit more aggressive with that roof in regards to getting it done sooner. So that can actually be chunked out in four different um, pieces, which would free up um, dollars in the immediate year. Um, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't be touching blue ash this year because it needs to be touched. It's just looking and working with our team at Garland to look at that a little bit different than what we had originally um, talked to them about. So quick question, when you have that $1.2 million for furniture, is that just for the high school budget? It's just for the high school okay. budget. So there are, two, there are two different pieces of that furniture budget. The first one is the furnishings for um, the current work that we're doing in regards to the locker rooms, the team rooms, um, the cafeteria tables and things like that. Um, we worked really hard. We actually value engineered that down by about $300,000 already. Um, in order to get it to where we felt comfortable with and reusing some furniture, but also making sure that we weren't reusing bad furniture, uh, furniture that passes prime. Um, then the second piece to the furniture is going to be the administrative areas, which will be the next kind of phase to get going. Um, we're also got classroom furniture that's coming in, but those are kind of the future two big um, furniture budgets that we have to manage. And Dr. Cedar, I want to be really clear with you and our community here today. We're not like cutting, you know, we've really done a good job over the years of keeping up to date with our furniture. And so it isn't like, you know, we're having like to make a decision to keep desks that are like unsafe. The or, <laughs> yeah, you know, like that. They're still, so what we would call like, we're phasing out some school district be like, this would be great. So, I mean, it's, we're, okay. we're doing our best to keep up with the times and, you know, the capital improvement budget has always been able to sustain some furniture for everyone. So we, um, we do an audit of all the furniture. We walk with our team, we look at it, and then we put together our proposals and then look at what we can use. So there's a there's a process that we go through to determine. Um, for example, that's how we led to keeping the desk for green and moving the existing desk over versus buying all new desk. And now we're working on a 10 year plan to then replace those desks over time versus spending all the bond money when we know that that budget's a little tight. So we make um, those decisions daily, but we do it in a structured way. Okay. Thank you. I guess I, I need a little bit of some translation here. <laughs> okay, so the roof, uh, the roofing. So same kind of question like furniture. You're saying we would delay 
changing out our roofs just in order just one to spread this over only on one project. Mm -hmm. And you yes. feel comfortable doing that? Mm -hmm. like this that. has been, I mean, we've known blue ash has been an issue. I mean, to be quite honest with you, they had to go through numerous um, problem solving issues when the building was originally built. So um, we've known at least for a couple of years, and we plan these out accordingly. So Sims was worse than Blue Ash. So like Sims just got finished ahead of the construction project. And every wing we renovated, we renovated the roof ahead of it. Because you never want to renovate a wing and then have leaky roofs on top of it. That's just a bad situation. So um, Blue Ash is in a much better condition and Sims was, but it, it is on that cycle to be replaced. It's not urgent. Yeah. It's not like, oh my so God. Delaying it is not going to cause. It's not going to. Blue Ash is a design flaw. And that's we're fixing design flaw versus I mean, there is some leaks, but we can, what we can do this year is invest dollars into short term fixes towards a long term plan, meaning we're not going to do something and tear it up, but what are the hot areas we need to address this year? and then progressively get into the replacement of that work piece. And you're saying the contingency, you need to keep this high of a number because you feel like that's gonna be needed. So that's I just think it's always an unknown. It's a risk. You know, you just, it, it, it's managing your risk, where you want to take the risk and you, know, you want us to come back to you with a potential another situation or would you rather us kind of manage the risk knowing that you know our team is not going to go and spend money <laughs> Are not authorized to be spent on. So, yeah. when we when we originally made the decision on the, the roof, everyone was agreeing we needed to do the roof work. When we did, we didn't want to put new construction in underneath the leaky roof. Yeah. A lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. It's effectively like a contingency, if you will, that we we said when we did that, if we come to the end of the project and we needed to use those monies, that we would. We said that at the time. Um, so effectively, which contingency pot we use here, this one or that one, is a little bit left pocket, right pocket, to be honest with you. Um, the thing that I would maybe ask for is if we could, and we've done this in the past, just do a, a double click again on the capital plans for the next five years. I have this sense that we're going to come, we come back and ask for investment towards some you know, other elements like pool. And I think really understanding because all this money is ultimately coming out of the general fund if that request comes that way. And so it, it's 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 left pocket, right pocket. It would really be helpful, I think, for if we could, not tonight, but at a future board meeting, to do just kind of a capital forecast for the next five years. I would really appreciate that. Absolutely. And then we can kind of, and we had a run rate for some time, I think, with um Cost that there is maybe we need a different run rate for our capital uh, plans, but if that's the case, that would affect our five-year forecast. Let's just go with, let's go through the the plan, okay. and if if we need to raise the capital run rate, we need to understand that and blend it into our five-year forecast and under, understand the full picture because we have a not just this decision. I think we have a couple of other decisions coming at us that having this complete picture will help us. I think make those decisions. Absolutely. We just wanted you to have all the information before we approve 275 <laughs> for the pool. We felt like it was best to give you all the information prior to voting on that. So just to be clear, tonight we're voting on the 275 for the pool and GFP for the interior athletics with the approval that you're taking 600,000 from project to put it in this from capital to put it into this one. It's not part of the resolution that we have a separate oh, separate if we could hold that until we, we have the bigger have review the, that would seem to make more sense. Yeah I agree with that yeah. so we could bring that in okay. any additional questions just one quick question about the native forum like design. Is that going to affect the new um, office area with construction at all? Is it going to be need to close part of that during you know what I'm saying? Because it's going to be a funny. Yeah, and Allison maybe put you on the spot. I don't know. Sorry. I mean, no, it's okay. That's a really good question because we're working through that at the moment in regards to 
the new front entrance, it won't affect necessarily the administration area or anything like that. But what we don't want to do is invest money into sidewalks and infrastructure and things like that that we might tear out then when we go to do the natorium. So um, there will be impact there, but it doesn't impact the site circulation. It won't impact the ability to have the new front entrance with kids going in and the administrative areas. It will just impact kind of that side where um, we're going to have to then go back and do some construction in that area. Yeah, and there there are going to be elements of, of the pool that will want to do it at you know summertime or or times when there aren't a lot of people on the campus just because it is very um, involved with the structural system of the existing building that there's a lot of technical detail yet to be worked out, but definitely something we're sensitive to and, and certainly don't want to see anything ripped out that was just put in. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mrs. Rollins, Ms. Cardo. Mr. Cullenford. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. Motion passes. Now we have a motion for a resolution approving GMP amendment number five to CMR agreement with HGC construction for the high school project. So moved. Second. Any additional information? Any additional questions from the board on, on interior athletics? Mr. Carver, please call the roll. Mr. Cumberford? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. And Dr. Steeter? Aye. The motion passes. The motion for the GMP agreement HGC secondary school interior athletics. That's the same. Okay. So that's the same okay. Sorry, I'm all out of here. It's, uh, yeah. We're out of Okay, I need a sorry about that. I need a motion for the approval of the service um, proposal with LA Rapid and Associates. Second. So uh, this is uh, an agreement with um, the Slatter Rapid and Associates to assist us with the Always an Aviator campaign and. Um, she has been, uh, we did a, a check of her references and <coughs> very satisfied with what we heard from uh, organizations and people that have used her for fundraising. Um, in addition, we also had our legal team uh, review the contract and they were happy with what they saw. So uh, we are prepared to move forward with her assisting us and um, even prior to, um, at no charge, she did it for free this year. Uh, Comfort. She was there present in a couple of meetings, uh, just getting to lay the land. So uh, I think she feels up to speed and already has strategies ready to go uh, in collaboration with Ms. Bond, right? So we're excited to uh, work with her and over the next 12 to 15 months, bring this project to a closure. Any questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, Ms. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. And Mr. Cullenford? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the change order Sycamore Junior High Construction Project. So moved. Second. Um, just you'll see a credit there for um, right around four thousand dollars. That was equipment that we had purchased that we um, it was not the equipment that we needed, and so we're actually doing direct purchase from Child Nutrition for the right equipment. Um, so that's that credit back, and then there's a power revision there that we had as well. Um, and then the other one is um, just working through um, some data conduits around that existing building over there. Mr. Cumberford? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. And Mr. Mallet? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the Sycamore High School renovation project, GMP number two. I'll move. Second. Um, there's nothing out of the ordinary on this one unless there's questions for you. Except for the stadium, stadium, stadium paving. Stadium, stadium, stadium yes. paving. Okay. That actually is campus paving. Um, okay. You'll see actually on the um, the change order it should say campus paving at the top of that. Does it? It's, it's for the roadway that 
internally within the site that was part of potentially yeah so supporting that when we worked with the city of montgomery on the plans for the multi-use stadium um, there's potential significant road work that will be done at cornell in the front of that property and so collaboratively, what we wanted to make sure we were doing was investing our dollars the right way and to support the city of Montgomery. And by doing that, what we did was we had to rework some of the access drives internally around that. Um, that got rid of the lower drive that currently kind of exists there that goes <coughs> to that, I can't remember the AIDS lot over there on the side. What we have to do now is we were able to scale the scope back of retaining walls and things like that to be able to put a north access drive in, which is mainly used for our fire EMS and things like that. And so that's the change order from our ability to kind of move some of that work around on that site. Thank you. I think it's just close to the stadium. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. It's and paving is very expensive right now. Yes, it is. Um, oil, anything related to it is really expensive. So that's why that number is significantly high. Dr. Steger, did you make the motion? Okay, it's Dr. Steger. Aye. Mr. Cullifer. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. And Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Motion passes. I made a motion for the easement to the Creek Condominium Association. So moved. Second. Um, this easement, we have some work that we have to do by the, um, I call it the old stadium, but the stadium on the junior high with some of the connections that we need over there. So we've been working with the Cooper Creek Condominium Association to be able to get that work done. Um, so we, so Monarch can continue. I just have a quick question about this. This is, it's like both Blue Ash and Montgomery, do you need to get permission? It's just the city of Montgomery. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Yep. Any additional questions? Mrs. Weber, please call her. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Steger. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. And Mr. Cullifer. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the agreement of child nutrition service with St. Cecilia School. So moved. <laughs> Um, our, child our child nutrition services um, works alongside some other schools, specifically related to um, St. Cecilia here and operating food service, and that's just to put this agreement in place. Mrs. Williams, call the roll. I second this motion. I second. Okay. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Mr. Cumberford. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, next is the announcement of graduation date for class of 2023 already. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Sunday, May 21st, 2023. We're ready to go. Let's go. Do you have a time? I don't think they set the times this early, but I'll have to check. But not at, not at this point, but it's typically in the morning. So, not this <laughs> if you want me there, so you can say, what are these kids to show up? Yeah. <laughs> Nine one. Oh, I remember. Nine that was tough. the earliest I remember. <laughs> I was kidding. I hope eleven. I like eleven. That was a good time. That was a very good time. Guys out after that. So. I need a motion for the resolution approving uh, easement for Duke Energy Sycamore High School construction project. So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Mr. Cumberford. This is just standard for the work that we need to do. Okay, uh, Mrs. Miller, please call the roll. Mr. Cumberford. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. And Dr. Steven. Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the resolution approving the easement for Duke Energy Sycamore High School, Sycamore Junior High School construction project. So moved. Second. Again, a standard request. Please call the roll. Mr. Cumberford. Aye. Dr. Steven. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. Motion passes. Mr. Lewis, other? Just for the essence of time, uh, it was great to recognize Lauren as the state champion, but you know, I'm hopeful that we can have our state champion tennis team back soon. They're, they're busy people, so we'll try to get those in front of, get them in front of you as well. Uh, cool experience for both of them. Um, not only our tennis team, but also Lauren are going to get a proclamation next Wednesday at the city of Montgomery. So um, really cool that the city of Montgomery does that and reached out and so they'll do a proclamation for the state champions. Um, and then the last thing I'll just mention is 
really had a great <laughs> experience the last day of school. I did not pick it. I was surprised the students picked it. Uh, but it, as you may recall, I've been meeting with a group of parents um, that are part of our uh, Asian leadership group in our community, and they really wanted me to hear from students. And I said, I love that. So we met at Dewey's Pizza, which we won't ever meet at Dewey's Pizza again. It was a very loud part of the students. <laughs> Um, in the room that I was in, but um, got some great feedback from the students and really appreciated them not only showing up, but showing up after the last day of school. So uh, the Lewis boys and myself got to listen to 10 high school students talk about their experience. So awesome. good feedback. That's really good. Thank you very much. I need a motion for the approval of the treasurer's consent agenda. So moved. Second. Anything you want to point out? Oh, really nice donations from Tyre um, Montgomery Elementary and Sons Elementary mm -hmm. to support student or to uh, I think mostly teacher um, suggestions or teacher kind of wish list. So that was a nice um, way to end our year with being able to provide for those um, <coughs> donations. We also had transfers from the general fund as planned to. Uh, support bond retirement for both of our energy conservation projects as well as getting close to the actual final. I think we have two more years worth of payments on this building. Ooh. 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 Yeah. Any questions from the board? Mrs. Member, please forward. Mr. Cumberford? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballard. All right, motion passes. I need a motion to approve the financial reports made 2022. So moved. Second. Second. All right. Um, okay. Items of note this time. I'm going to say. <laughs> In a couple items of note, we did receive our what will be our final um, payment of TPP reimbursement from the state. Um, the reduction of about a million dollars from last year, but it's our, our final year of receiving those funds. Um, as far as expenses go, we are in line, I believe, with having a good a good finish within um, our our overall budget in the general fund. Um, as included in our five year forecast based on where, we're, where our expenses are at this point in time. So, any questions? Mr. Cumberford? Mr. Cumberford? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of. FY 2022 appropriation measure. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, I apologize for the timing of getting this to you. The appropriation measure is basically um, our guideline, this, this one in particular, for the 21 22 school year. We've been working through this, we've been getting um, informed of uh, progress of our budget in all areas throughout the year. This particular document is really doing a lot of the cleanup to make sure that we meet um, the uh, Ohio Revised Code standards for um, budget and timing and resources and things like this. So the, the final cleanup was really just trying to make sure we were in compliance for our audit. Um, overall, our general fund um, allocation is aligned with the five-year forecast that you approved in May. Um, and all the other areas are uh, based on uh, revisions to the, the appropriation that you've been making throughout the year. Um, we, did, we will have our final payroll on Friday, and that's one of the key things so is kind of getting the information that we need to make these final cleanup items. So, um, $140 million budget. A lot of it is because of the construction that we have going on right now. Associated bond retirement and additional federal grants this year with the ESSER money. So, about $3 million in our budget um, for ESSER. We have probably about a million, million and a half next year as well. So, as we, we, as we close out all of those funds. 
Any questions from the room? Mrs. Bevan, please call up. Mr. Cullenberg. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballard. Aye. And Mrs. Bitter. Aye. I, I will add to, as has been our, our practice at the July evening meeting, I will give an overview of our 21 22 budget so that you can see the final outcomes as well. Thank you. a motion to approve FY 23 temporary appropriation motion. I move. Second. Uh, this is a temporary um, uh, budget to get us started for the year. Uh, in many areas, we took uh, what we spent basically from this year. Um, we did update all of the department budgets, all of the building budgets, so they've all went through that budget process, so their budgets are in place for next year. Um, retirement is already determined based on our, our payment schedules, but we have a lot of work to do to go through all of those uh, personnel items you continue to see on um, the agenda to make sure that we have all of our budget aligned with our staff needs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when we had our discussion about the um, idea or the IDEA budget, all of the federal budget allocations are coming in this week. And so we'll be working to um, get those the application into the Ohio Department of Education. You'll see uh, additional dollars added to the budget um, for those federal grants. And uh, we also will need to be working through some of the final budget amounts for our construction projects as we look at some of the fundraising that we're doing and the um, additional ex external um, athletics, as well as finalizing the budget for the transportation facility. Those are the two kind of big things that are still sitting out there that we'll need to um, budget uh, with additional monies for next year. Thank you very Any much. Question? Mrs. Robert, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. And Dr. Steven? Aye. <coughs> motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the contract services from Hamilton County, Hamilton Claremont Cooperative. So moved. Second. Uh, we utilize the Hamilton Claremont Cooperative uh, to support our financial software as well as our um, in software for tracking of students for ODE. This year we also added final forms, which is the product that we've been using to uh, oversee with our athletic documentation as well as our um, information forms management for students. Um, so that cost did it actually come down a little bit, Mr. Fritz, from what we were paying before we could go into the consortium, or it's fairly similar to what we were. It's almost about the same. If you go into the consortium model, you would actually maintain that price structure. So while the cost of the so while the cost of the overall contract went up, it was because we had been purchasing vital forms from a different source. So it was about the same cost overall. For the cost avoidance versus a savings. Pardon? It was a cost avoidance versus a savings. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Please Mr. Cumberbund. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Mr. Ballant. All right, motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of Ohio School Com Workers' Compensation Group retrospective program. So moved. Second. We're asking that we continue with um, Sedgwick as the manager of our workers' comp, um, with our claims management, as well as um, our procurement um, services. We've been in the group retrospective rating program for several years now, and it, it's really uh, proven to help us uh, with keeping our costs low. I think primarily because of the support of, of Sedgwick and claims management, um, helping us with um, work um, and work related. Yeah. yeah. So they, they help us with all of that, but through the, um, through the group retrospective rating program, if our group does better than what we would have on our own, we can get refunds back. And this year, I think we got about $70,000 back from past years because of performance of the group. So yeah, we continue on with this service. 
Mrs. Byron, please call the roll. Dr. Stiegler? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Ballot? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the personnel consent agenda, which is agenda 2K. So Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Stewart? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. And Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. Um, moving on to other Board of Education business. I need a motion for the approval of the contract extension for uh, our treasurer, Mrs. Weber. So moved. Second. So please call the Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Ballard? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. And Dr. Seeger? Aye. Motion passes, and Mrs. Weber, we look forward to working with you for one more year. <laughs> Me too. Is that supposed to be 2025? It's going to be the best year ever. The best year ever. That's right. You said it out loud. It's going to be the best year ever. That's right. <laughs> Next item we have on other board of education, other board of education business is the evaluation of our superintendent. Uh, per ORC and board policy, the board evaluates our, both our superintendent and treasurer uh, on an annual basis, and we, we did complete Mr. Lewis's evaluation. Um, Mr. Lewis had a strong first year as superintendent of Sycamore Community Schools. The board recognizes the strengths he's brought to the district as well as opportunities for growth and personal development. Mr. Lewis highlighted our vision and mission and team meetings goals and aligned his goals around them. He has a strong work ethic, is visible in schools and throughout the community. Under Mr. Lewis's leadership, despite strong headwinds, our multiple construction projects remain on schedule and on budget. Mr. Lewis has worked hard to promote a workplace culture that emphasizes everyone moving towards the same goal for, district, for the district and for vertical alignment. Mr. Lewis's goals uh, were five standards, which included uh, vision, continuous improvement, and focus of district work. Standard two was communication and collaboration. Standard three was policies and governance. Standards four were instruction, and standard five was resources. The board felt that Mr. Lewis made significant progress on all the standards. Uh, the board will be adding an addendum to his uh, evaluation when we do have um, some of our academic performance um, results, which typically come in the September, October time. Or the board believes in continuous improvement and development. Um, and we'd like to see Mr. Lewis work on his emotional quotient. He would, we would like to see him develop a deeper understanding of curriculum. Um, also, um, allowing um, his leaders to lead in their uh, categories. And we would like to see Mr. Lewis, uh, I would say the board recognizes that the ongoing development of teachers is critical to the academic success of our students. And we'd like to see continued input from the student, from the teachers um, and continued improvements to, uh, for, uh, professional development needs. The board expects that the results of the curriculum audit will be used to ensure that the district curriculum, instruction, and assessment programs are designed to provide full access and opportunities for all students. And the board requests that any material sent to the board is done so in a timely manner uh, so that we have ad adequate time to prepare. In summary, the Board of Education appreciates the hard work, dedication, and work ethic that Mr. Lewis has demonstrated in his first year as superintendent of Sycamore Community Schools. We look forward to his continued development and ongoing collaborative board relationships. I'd like to thank you for all your work that you've done for the district over this year, Mr. Lewis. Um, and you know the next step in our process will be to work with you to develop goals. Looking forward to the 22-23 school. So thank you very much. It's going to be the best year ever. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> next on our agenda is uh, Sycamore Business Advisory Council report. So um, I have a few things to go through as far as the Sycamore Business Advisory Council. So historically, this was um, called the Executive Advisory Committee and has changed names to the Business Advisory <laughs> Committee. In the past, this was a one-way communication. Typically, the district provided information to the committee. Um, there was little to no action between meetings. Meetings were held quarterly. The minutes were taken and posted, along, posted on the district website along with the, agenda, with the agenda. Per ORC and the Sycamore Policy BCF, the Business Advisory Committee must advise and make recommendations to the Board of Education 
concerning the delineation, 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 delineation of employment skills and the development of curriculum to instill these skills. They must um, make recommendations to the board concerning changes in the economy and in the job market and make recommendations on suggestions for developing a working relationship among businesses, labor organization, and educational personnel. So starting this year, um, under Mr. Lewis, um, the board, the, the BAC really started to have discussions on what the purpose of the group was. And we came up with a um, kind of a, uh, an outline of what, what, the, what Mr. Lewis and his team, as well as the BAC thought the purpose was. And that was to help the district remain focused on their goals aligned with the needs of the business community. This, this, you know, this relates back to um, one of the purposes of the ORC, I'm sorry, of the BAC per ORC, uh, aligning the skill set needed in today's business world and changes in the job market. Another purpose was to bring diverse thinking external benchmark to meet the challenges faced by the district, which relates back to community partnerships, community outreach to the business community, again, relating back to community partnerships, to support the school community and provide opportunities for students and graduates, uh, relating back to the type of jobs that, will be, that are available now and will be in the future. Um, another purpose was to be change agents and ambassadors for the implementation of the strategic plan, um, awareness of cultural differences, maintain strong partnership, and to focus on the whole child to build skills on uh, not just skills uh, or academic measures. Um, we did, um, looking into the 22 20 22-23 school year, um, there'll be some changes in how the membership is determined. In the past, the membership was brought um, by the, was determined by the superintendent. Um, if you will recall on the March 23rd meeting, we did vote on membership for the BAC um, and approve the, the, the membership. As we, as we go into the 22-23 school, uh, school year, the membership per policy, school board policy BCF, is that all appointments to the advisory committees are made by the superintendent with the approval by the board. That being said, um, Mr. Lewis and I, as the representative on the BAC, welcome any Board of Education input. If there's somebody that you would feel uh, would like to be on the BAC, please pass that information along to Mr. Lewis. Previous members will be strongly considered based on their attendance and their input they've had at past meetings. Um, the superintendent, board representative, and, and the committee leadership will make recommendations, and the final, um, the final recommendation will come from the superintendent per our board policy. The board will approve the membership, and of course, you can always ask for individual roll calls. Um, again, moving into the 22-23 school year, we'll continue to have the minutes and the agendas posted on the website, as we have in the past. Um, we do need to work on improving the noticing of the meetings um, for, the, for the Business Advisory Council and also, the, and also for SAC, um, and that will occur prior to any meetings starting for the 22-23 school year for both committees. Um, we are looking at improving our website, so there'll be more information on the purpose of the Business Advisory Committee listed on the website, and there will be regular updates to the Board of Education um, following the uh, Business Advisory Council meetings. A couple last things. Um, at the May 18th meeting, um, we did talk as a group about having a formalized leadership committee um, or officers, which again would be similar to SAC. Uh, Mr. Lewis is meeting with a couple of people who have expressed interest in being on the leadership team for the BAC next year. Uh, we will be developing bylaws using the SAC bylaws as an example. Um, and the Business Advisory Council leadership team will have also have inputs on the agenda. And finally, um, we'll have project teams uh, for the business advisory committee, similar to what we have with SAC. So there'll be purpose, there'll be business, um, sorry, there'll be project teams, um, and they'll report back to the, to the BAC overall. We did start to, to look at what projects could um, have an initial discussion on what projects would be for next year. Nothing's been finalized, but some of the ideas were um, to, have to help to find the skills businesses need uh, for employees in today's business world and how Sycamore can develop that skill set in our graduates. Um, another one was to provide connections for students and districts with local business community. Another one was to develop career awareness programs. What are the job options that are available today with specific group degrees so our students would have an idea what they could do um, with degrees after they earn them. 
Um, and then the last one was internships. You know, and all of those four project areas relate back to what the purpose of the BAC is per ORC. Um, so, so kind of in summary, there are no meeting dates set for the BAC next for next school year yet. Um, and they will not meet again until the membership has been voted on. Uh, the meeting dates will be set, uh, posted on our website, and we will improve the notice. So that was a lot. Any questions? Was there a notice for the last meeting? It was noticed on our website, yes. It was. Just um, one question, Mr. Ballard. Is there going to be an application process similar to the um, Sycamore Advisory Commission uh, as part of the uh, bylaws, or is it going to be by uh, recommendation only? Um, that's a good question. Um, we will be developing bylaws similar to SAC, so I think yeah. two of you want to <laughs> It is not required. To do bylaws that were the BAC. Uh, the, the group, I think, in general, felt like, you know, I, I think one of the struggles that Mr. Fallon laid it out really well was just it needed to, it lacked purpose and needed to have structure. So I think naturally that's something that we're going to work to develop, but that had not been decided just as but we will develop the necessary structure. Reason I, that's part of the reason I ask is because the bylaws of SAC include the uh, application process. So if we're going after that, I was curious if, we, if that was also the intent. Yeah, because I'd like to see that too. I like that process that the SAC that SAC has, so that various members of the business community can have a chance to be on it, you know, to have input. They're if they're part of our community and they want to have input, just like families want to be on the on SAC, just to keep it, you know, just open so that we're not just handpicking only certain people to be on it. I was just, just seems fair. I was just asking the question. I wasn't oh. like trying to say. Oh, yeah, it, I was. I yeah. I, 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 I think it's a good idea. I like how SAC does it because it opens it up to more people that way they have an opportunity, um, and it changes. Over the years, obviously. I have one other just general question. I know that um, I believe our attorney is on on the business advisory committee. Is it? I think it was listed. David. <coughs> My question is: Do we have to pay him to be on our committee? Does the district pay him for that? I don't believe so. Because he's not there to give legal advice. He's just there. Right. To be part of the legal community. That's something we can Yes, I just I just saw that <coughs> question. Okay. Um, next thing on our agenda is uh, um, policy project. Okay. Um, just a reminder. <coughs> Ms. Haycox will be at our July 6th meeting to go through our next board review. I still owe her a few things for her to get her finalized draft of um, second draft of the policy manual. Until then, uh, you should also have your usernames and passwords to be able to go out and look at um, the draft as it is initially submitted. Um, between now and then, I plan to take a look at everything you've done. With I don't know if you and I may need to meet one more time. Um, but if there are any specific policies between now and then that you want um, Kenna to, to help us with um, in that session, I know she has some follow up from our, our first session as well. So um, if there's any, any follow up at the end of the time, just please let us know. And um, I thought process, I thought would be either to have approval of the manual on. July at the July evening meeting, but my guess is more likely the office. Okay. Um, next, um, I need a motion for the approval of the settlement agreement. So moved. Second. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Ballot. Aye. Um, I'm sorry, Aye. Mr. Comifer. Aye. <laughs> Dr. Steger. Aye. Mr. Ballot. Aye. Mrs. Bitter. Hi, and Mrs. Weiss. Hi. Motion passes. Um, we did not have legislative update on this, so I'd like to have a legislative update from Mrs. Uh, Weiss. Yes. Okay. Um, 
couple things. Just if you recall at our last meeting, I announced that um, Stephen Dakin was appointed as the state superintendent of public instruction. Um, he has since resigned. Um, and Dr. Stephanie Siddons is serving as, inter as interim state superintendent and they will start the process again um, to interview candidates. Um, House Bill 105 would require public schools to provide age appropriate instruction in child sexual abuse and sexual violence prevention and require in-service staff training in child sexual abuse prevention. The committee has held its third hearing. House Bill 151, um, this bill um, was amended on the House floor to include provisions of House Bill 61, which would enact the Save Women's Sports Act to require schools and public and private colleges to designate separate single sex teams and sports for each sex. There is a concern that this bill would require possibly a physical examination. There is concern about how a participant's sex would be verified and whether a physical exam, genetic makeup and or lab test would be required. And lastly, which we talked about um, earlier and had public participation on is House Bill 99. It was enacted on June 13th and signed by Governor DeWine. And this is about arming um, school staff. This requires a person a school board authorizes to have weapons in such a zone to successfully complete no more than 24 hours of initial training established under the bill, or the person has received a certificate of satisfactory completion um, of a training program. Please note that the required amount of training that passed in this bill to allow a school employee to bring a firearm to school is less training than is re the requirement for a teacher to renew their teaching license or for a teenager to obtain a driver's license. Most law enforcement and teacher organizations have opposed this law. And as Mr. Balance stated, our policy supersedes uh, the passage of this bill. Any questions about legislative update? Yeah, I would just wanna make it very clear that our current policy you know, is enforced uh, to the public and that you know, it, there will be no changes in the ability for our staff to carry weapons onto our school grounds based on House Bill 99. Our policy supersedes that. As Mrs. Weber said, we've consulted with our legal counsel on that matter, um, and there'll be no changes to our current um, ability for teachers to bring weapons. Mr. Lewis, do you want to comment? I just wanted to comment that, um, you know, I have spoken to several, um, not only our union leaders, but um, I think uh, our local law enforcement and you know essentially they support us with whatever decisions that we believe are best uh, for our students but uh, I can tell you uh, our union leaders from SEA and OPC Mrs. Grace and Mrs. Creel uh, were both very adamant that their organizations are in opposition of this and um, you know very supportive of us not making any uh, changes to our board policy um, to allow this to happen. And you know, I think the, probably the biggest part that hits me is that um, our teaching staff have already enough responsibility. Our uh, classified staff have enough responsibility uh, to put them in a situation where they're taking training and you know, carrying firearms and making these, you know, those are really difficult decisions when you get thrust into that with very little training. Um, I think they felt strongly that you know, uh, and appreciate our asking, but also um, our board policy that currently prohibits this. And um, I think the other thing I would say is that our law enforcement officers would say the best way to prevent it, any situations from occurring is training. Um, the current training that we already do with our students and our staff of safety training, but they would also say that a law enforcement officer being present. So, you know, we believe that we need additional layers of security you know, they would be more apt to have us talk with them about, you know, excuse me, additional school resource officers, additional police officers being present versus, you know, putting um, our own staff in that situation. So um, I appreciate always the support of our municipalities and their partnership and uh, their quick response whenever we need them. Um, I know that several of us were at the Memorial Day Parade and, um, 
Chief Noel made a point to come over and reassure us that they have our back and they will always be here to protect us. And I believe that about all of our municipalities and our sheriff's department that they will uh, be here to protect us. So um, appreciate uh, Mrs. Weiss giving that update and certainly the support of the board of um, you know, our current board policy standing. There's no other comments from the board. We will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oh, <laughs>